call the roll. Here. Present. Thank you. Our invocation today will be delivered by Pastor Justin Rhymes from Grace Baptist Church. Thank you for coming out today. After the invocation, please remain standing for our pledges. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for the newness of the day, the beauty of the creation, Lord, the work of your hands that we see as we realize the Lord, the newness of the morning, Lord, we are reminded of your mercies as well, Father. I pray for your mercies on this court, for your protection, for your guidance, for your wisdom, Lord, for your discernment upon this group today as they meet to take care of the matters of Tarrant County. Lord, I thank you for their, Lord, their respected homes, their respected districts, and I pray for their families and for their constituents, Lord, and for those that they serve, Lord, may we have in mind the greater good, Father, the unity that we have in knowing you. God, we pray also for just a protection on our county, on our state, and on our country. And Lord, will you continue to guide us, Lord, protect us, and Lord, as you've done for so many centuries, Lord, give us the wisdom, the knowledge, the discernment, Lord, also, Lord, the, Lord just the patience to do what is right, to do what is good, so that, Lord, more and more people might be able to know you and to know your love. Father, we thank you again for the men and women gathered here. Pray also for just a protection as we leave this place, Lord. May your mercies travel with us throughout this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to these Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Pastor, for coming out today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. <coughs> Manius? Thank you, Your Honor. Members of the court, I just have one announcement. It doesn't apply to this agenda, but just remind the court that on March 5th, it's the first Tuesday in March, uh, we are not going to have Commissioner's Court meeting that day. That is uh, the NACO Legislative Conference in D.C. And so uh, if you can adjust your calendars as it relates to that particular issue. Thank you. Thank you. Court members, you have before you our regular minutes of our January 22nd meeting. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. We have a couple of proclamation or res uh, resolutions uh, this morning, and the first is a resolution of recognition for Perry Bottom. Perry, come on down. Uh, I'll read that into the record, and then I'll uh, bring the plaque and... Commissioner Fickle, you might join me in that. Absolutely. Whereas Perry began his life, his firefighting career in Halton City in 1989, holding several positions during his tenure, and was eventually named fire chief in 2017. And whereas Perry established the Halton City's emergency management program and served as the first emergency management coordinator, and whereas Perry has served on multiple committees advising working groups, chaired the Emergency Preparedness Planning Council and Regional Emergency Preparedness Advisory Committee and led countless other regional efforts. And whereas Perry has long been a dedicated public servant and has led by example, <coughs> focused on transparency, advocated for the will of the region and has given tirelessly of himself for others and through all, Perry has kept his faith, family and community as his top priorities now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Commissioner's Court of Tarrant County, do hereby honor and recognize Perry Bonham for his valuable contributions to Tarrant County in the North Central Texas region. And further, we wish him the best in his retirement and thank him for his public service. In witness whereof, we have herein to set our hands 
and cause the seal of Tarrant County to be affixed this 29th day of January 2019. I'll move its approval. Second. We have a motion and second. <coughs> motion passes unanimously. You bet. Come on down. Now, Judge, you forgot a couple things. Yes, I did. Um, Go ahead and remind well, me. Well, Terry's been a fabulous uh, city councilman for the city of you would. And then on top of that, if you ever get an opportunity to play golf and you need somebody that can play, that's the man. <laughs> and I need him on my team. Okay. <laughs> Isn't that right? Isn't that right? What do you say, brother? <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to introduce your, uh, your, your wife? I'm uh, assuming that's your wife. Yes, my lady wife, 37 years, Lisa Bynum. She's, she's been my rock. Lisa, thank you very much for being a part of this also. Let's go ahead. Okay, we need to be good to her. Okay. Mm -hmm. The paparazzi. You get all kinds of upset. You don't get that. I only have one question. What do we do when you don't have three flashes? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, sir, we're good. We're good. <laughs> yes, sir, I did. Is this a new thing here now? We're going to have this work? Are you just your flash broken? Judge, commissioners, uh, I'm really not worthy of this resolution, but thank you. Uh, the serving the citizens of Tarrant County has been a pure pleasure. Serving the citizens of Hotham City has been a pure pleasure. Serving the citizens of Euless has been a pure pleasure. So uh, thank you, and I hope that you continue to support the cause of emergency management in Tarrant County. So, Judge, once again, thank you. Commissioners, thank you. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Commissioner Brooks and Allen, I believe y'all have a uh, memorial resolution. Yes, Your Honor. Commissioner Allen and I sponsored this memorial resolution honoring Mrs. Reese Davis English, a pillar of the Lake Como community who passed away at the age of 106. Wow. She was funeralized on Saturday, and she is the grandmother of Congressman Mark Fesey. Commissioner? Well, and I did not have the honor of meeting Miss Reese Davis English, but one of her relatives was a longtime mentor of mine who passed in 2017. Her name is Mary Labetta English Sowles, and she was a retired executive for Mary Kay also a lifetime member of the American Cancer Society and established the Purple Tees that we see throughout Tarrant County. So great family and um, our, certainly my thoughts and prayers will be with them during the loss. I move approval, move ratification of this memorial resolution. Second. A motion to second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, the other thing that I would just uh, mention uh, somewhat in passing is that Friday, February the 1st, is to wear red, uh, and that's in honor of the, um, bless you. You see that, Benny? Yes, sir. Uh, you, you trained me well. I want to be sure. There might be another one coming. Uh, but for the American Heart Association, and so I would encourage everyone to um, wear red and in, uh, in honor of that. And then Commissioner think, Fickers. Yes, on Friday, February the 8th, we'll have our 10th Annual Northeast Terror Transportation Summit at the Hearst Conference Center. And it starts at 8 in the morning. We have, a, a, I think, a fabulous program. It's going to go on until about 1.30. We've got some great speakers. We're going to be talking about airplanes that go faster than the speed of sound but don't make any noise when they break the sound barrier. 
that? We talked about that a little bit last week. But I'm not going to try to remember what it was. Is that rocket scientist science or yeah. what? Um, it's not bean counting. We're going to yeah. talk about all types of ways to get from here to here. <coughs> and uh, come see us. It'll be a fun day. Thanks. Call my office if you, uh, if you or would like to, to come and get a have a seat. And uh, you might get set next to Mr. Wilder. <laughs> <laughs> and your honor, if I may. Sure. Thank you. On February the 16th, which is Valentine's Day Saturday, Saturday <clears throat> uh, Precinct 1 will be sponsoring its fifth annual prostate cancer education and screening event. This event is free to the public. It is important that men know their prostate health status because early diagnosis is the key to survival. Come out on February the 16th, 10 a.m. to the Moncrief Cancer Institute on Magnolia Avenue, get educated, get screened, and uh, let's save some lives. Uh, you may pre-register by going to the Tarrant County website, going to the Commissioner Precinct 1 webpage, and drilling down to the Prostate Cancer Initiative or you can call 817-531-5600. Commissioner Allen. Yes. You just look like you're wanting to say something. <laughs> and besides that, you told me you did. Yes. Well, I just wanted to share with everyone that next Saturday, February 9th, is the Young Women Run North Texas Annual Conference hosted by the nonpartisan nonprofit organization Ignite. They're a statewide organization, and they host these conferences throughout the state. Um, and so Ignite was launched in 2011 and seeks to <coughs> train young women in high schools, also colleges and universities. They have a, a collegiate council at uh, TCU. So uh, myself and many other women speakers, public servants, and elected officials will be serving um, as speakers, rather, at that conference. It will be at TCC Trinity River campus and visit ignitenational.org or you can contact our office. There is the cost of registration is either free or there is a nominal fee. So, Young Women Run North Texas next Saturday. So they're going to teach you how to run? Well, so they teach you any number of things regarding, regarding civic engagement. And oh, you mean run for engagement. office and not That's just right. run. Yeah. Did I leave that part out? <laughs> well, you said run. Teach you how to run. I, was, I immediately Texas. turned you off when you said you were going to teach me how to run. I, <laughs> you can't talk about heart health and not about running. Well, I, I, but now what kind of run are we talking about? No, I walk in the heart health thing. I don't, I don't ever run. I walk. Serving in your community in the area of civics oh, okay. or politics. I, I now begin to understand what you're saying. All right. Very good. Commissioner Johnson, don't you have something you'd like to? You can begin to remind us. I stopped, Joe, but I, I'm not real sure what day the sale is. So, but oh, I will be calling names probably at the next court meeting. Yeah, because it'll be uh, participated. Oh, we'll have a couple meetings. At uh, Jeanette, make sure I bring a check, please. <laughs> you get my check. I don't know if we did or not. I hadn't seen oh, well, okay, now we're ready to move forward with the rest of our business and the more important stuff, or maybe not the more important stuff. Um, court members, y'all have the consent agenda? Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. And I believe that the Ms. Glenn is next. Move to receive and file the personnel agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second to receive and file the personnel agenda. Any discussion? 
Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Good morning and thank you. So the next three items, items two, three, and four, are all out of class pay extension um, requests. The first is for pretrial release. Mr. Bainey is, requ is requesting an extension mm -hmm. of out of class pay through May 1st at an estimated cost to the general fund of a little bit more than $1,000, which does include fringe benefits. Move approval. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. The next request, uh, also for Mr. Manius, we're requesting uh, the extension of out of class pay in this case through May 1st, or I'm sorry, May 3rd. This is associated with the uh, currently vacant transportation director position. Uh, looking at an estimated cost to the road and bridge fund of approximately $1,700, which does include fringe benefits. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. And our, our third request comes from Constable Precinct 2. Constable's requesting an extension of out of class pay in this uh, case through May 4th. We're estimating a cost to the general fund of a little bit more than $900, which does include fringe benefits. Move for approval. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? <coughs> Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. And our final two items are both uh, changes to table of organizations. The first, the county clerk, Ms. Nicholson, is requesting the addition of a project uh, position. This would, of course, assist in her ongoing imaging scanning project. Uh, this will not impact the general fund. She's requesting this change effective January 30th. Move approval. I'll second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. And our second and last item in TO change is for precincts one, two, three, and four. This is the reclass of the assistant director of field operations position to a pay grade 75, effective January 30th. We're estimating an impact uh, for fiscal year 19 to road and bridge, uh, the road and bridge fund of approximately $17,000, which again does include fringe benefits. Move approval. Okay. I've got a question I want to ask. There's <clears throat> looking at the job description. <laughs> normally, each of, each position in a precinct matches that in the other precincts: director, assistant director, so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. In this particular uh, position, we have one precinct. One has a job description. Precinct two and three have a job description. Precinct four has the original job description. Mm -hmm. What do we have to do to get all of these to match again? Again, so historically, Commissioner, uh, the precincts, uh, we've worked with representatives from each precinct to come to agreement uh, on a job description. You're correct, typically they do match. There are some differences. Um, but if there's a desire to have those all link up and match again, then that would simply be work uh, from our office and then representatives from each of the precincts to make that happen. Well, my, my suggestion is that we do this, that we get whoever together mm -hmm. and get, let's get one job description because they all do the same work. I'm not opposed to that. You're what? I'm not opposed to that. Okay. Uh, makes sense to me. Should have been that way to get it. Yeah. So I guess at this point in time, I would, the question that I would ask of you, Ms. Glenn, is mm -hmm. do we need to make that happen before we pass that, or do we pass this and then make that happen? Typically, you would want to make that happen before you would, um, approve uh, a reclass that would impact all four precincts. No. Typically that's how it would happen. Certainly you all could do something different. We could approve it today, begin the work, uh, and then if there were any changes, report those to you. I think probably the reason he asked that question is if we all had the same mm -hmm. 
job description, would it change the proposal that's on the title? Well, I'm, what I'm wondering is, is would it end, if we're going to end up bringing everybody back to the, um, does it end up changing the anybody's pay in any of the other precincts? These positions are not tied in any way, shape, or form, as I understand it now, to the uh, to the formula. Correct. No, Changing the grade of the position does not, in and of itself, change anybody's pay. It changes the upside uh, of the range. It's up to the individual commissioner as to whether or not they want to take advantage of that by giving a pay increase to their uh, incumbent. Uh, I've got a particular problem that I'm trying to solve. We've discussed it. Uh, I thought we had agreed. And I'd like to uh, like us to proceed to a vote. And, I, and again, that, I'm okay with that, but, but I, I guess where I might in a little bit, I think if you do that, if you change the grade, historically, that has changed the compensation because it's been viewed as almost a reclass, I believe. Well, this, this and is with that comes a 5% mm -hmm. historically. Mm -hmm. I understand that in any instance, the department head or elected official uh, can, can like choose not to, not to do it. Correct. But historically, that means there's a 5% increase. Uh, and then look at, the, you know, longevity and different things like that. There's a 5% increase if anybody is below the hiring rate for that range. Uh, that doesn't affect anybody as I understand it. So the reclass, uh, and I think all of the points that have been made are accurate, so there's no requirement that once a reclass has been approved that there comes subs a subsequent pay increase. It is also true that there is typically a pay increase that follows a reclass. And the reclass policy will allow for a 5% increase over current pay or a 5%, and Ann's jumping if I'm incorrect, I think it's over the hiring rate if the salary is below the hiring rate. Where is she? For the hiring rate, you automatically go to the hiring rate if well, it's a the reclass. Okay, 5% over current or the hiring rate, whichever is greater. And I think in this instance, we're talking about a 5% over current salary for all of the existing incumbents, I believe. Is that so, correct? But right now, I guess the question would be is mm -hmm. if, if we looked at doing what the court has said they are agreeable to doing, and that's mm -hmm. bringing everybody back to a mm -hmm. to the same job description, job description mm -hmm. is that likely to result in a reclass where someone is going to move from one grade to another? So the way that the process works uh, typically is that uh, if, a, if a department or departments in your case are looking at a job description and wish to make changes to the job description, then those changes are reviewed first by HR and if there are significant differences then the, the next step would be that the review would be had by the Job Evaluation Committee. And then once the job gets to the Job Evaluation Committee, the Job Evaluation Committee goes through their process, evaluates the job, and then determines if, if a higher pay grade is warranted by but vote of the committee. But, and, and I guess I may have misunderstood to some extent. I thought that even though each precinct may have a different description for mm -hmm. this particular position mm -hmm. that they were all of the same grade. Is that true or not true? That's, that's they correct. are all of the same pay grade. Okay, so there would not be a reclass then that we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be facing the instance that there would be a reclass because they're all of the same grade right now anyway. So as Commissioner Brooks is saying, um, I, okay, I see both and Robin we, and we, Ange now having this 
just so, crossed eyebrows like he doesn't know what he's talking about. So y'all get up here and tell me what so I'm talking Tina, about. Tina, so and, and we, we kind of skipped a step by going directly to hay or whatever they're called now, mm-hmm. corn ferry, and had them to review the grade. And they designed our system. They're the ones who maintain our system. They looked at the job and decided that it should be a 75. What we did was to merely concur. So, uh, and what, this is- job description that they use to come up with this? So, I'll just say this, and then I'll let Ange answer that question, Commissioner Johnson. Ange has just indicated that currently all precincts do have the same job description for this position. So the question is, what job description was used? So right now they're all grade 74 assistant directors under the same description. Commissioner Brooks and his staff proposed a new job description that was uh, sent to Hay Corn Ferry. They reviewed that proposed description and said it recommended a grade 75. So we right now don't have a consistent job description. If you may recall last week, I sent out an email with that proposed job description based on Precinct 1's uh, submission to Corn Ferry. And so that is in your email boxes or um, someone's email box for review. So that has been our effort to date to get back to one position description. I got it. I didn't get it back to you, but I'll find it. And as far as the reclass issue goes, I mean, we are really reclassifying these four positions from a 74 to a 75. So again, subject to your authority, you can or cannot give these people either a 5% increase or an increase to the hiring rate. So they're not currently all under, if, if we approve this for Commissioner Brooks, then at that point in time, his is a 75 and the others are a 74. This action covers all four precincts, so they will all go to 75 if you approve this action. And we will adopt the new job description that Commissioner Brooks. Well, we're working on it. I mean, that email was the attempt to get working on it and get a consistent job description for all four precincts. Well, I'm sure you sent it, but I don't recall seeing it, which I could have just overlooked. I'd like sure. an opportunity to review that first. Okay, so then what I hear you saying, and I think, I don't know, I'm not going to speculate with what I hear others saying, I'm just going to say what I heard you just say was, is that you would like for us to look at this before we vote to the Was there an opportunity for me to review it and then we read it in the same meeting? Um, How do we normally I would. I mean, yes, we could do that after close. It would be after closed, and um, we could do that, or we can wait. Our next our next meeting would be next week. We can wait till next week to do that. And I don't have a, I don't have a preference one way or the other. I think we could. I don't either. Do you want? I'm fine. I'm waiting. Can we wait a week? Sure. Then at this point, I'd like to, we'll just hold it for a week, and then we'll, uh, we'll go back. So uh, I'll remove my second, and you'll, if and Commissioner Brooks has indicated he's okay with waiting until next week, so we'll just pull the motion back at this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Vinny, come on down. Good morning, Your Honor. Members morning. Of the board. Morning. Uh, public health has one item uh, for your consideration this morning. It's a request for approval of uh, memorandums of understanding uh, between Tarrant County and various clients for a laboratory testing service. 
Um, state gives us some money for infertility prevention project. Uh, so these are no money uh, MOUs with several entities across various counties. Uh, we have a regional lab, so it's to provide STD testing at no cost to those entities because of the grant money that we receive. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. <coughs> Commissioner Brooks, I believe you have an interlocal agreement today. I do have an interlocal agreement, I believe. It is item nine. In one A and B. In one A and B. Approved by the district attorney's office. Yes, Thank you. I move approval of item nine in one A and B. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Are there any appointments today? None. Then we will move on to the approval of the claims, including the addendum. Move approval of the claims, including the addendum. Second. We have a motion and second to approve the claims, including the addendum. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Briefing items, Mr. Mangus. Thank you, Your Honor. Members of the Court, we have several items on the briefing agenda this morning. The first is public health update. So it's a cold day to be talking about flu again, uh, but I figured I'll bring you up to speed on how the season's progressing. Uh, so this is our second briefing this season on flu. Um, so again, like I normally start with national situational awareness. As you can see, most of the flu activity is concentrated in southern half of the United States. There's some on the east coast up to the northeast, uh, but primarily mostly southern states and below, below the center half of the country. Um, Texas has increased in activity a little bit uh, from the first week. Um, but actually what is not shown here, so the left map is the first week and then the right map is the third week. What we haven't shown is the second week, which actually had a drop in activity, and then we've picked back up into higher levels of activity across the state. Um, this is just a map. Um, it doesn't show severity. The other maps that show colors are more indicative of uh, activity levels. This map particularly shows the type of flu uh, viruses that are circulating in the community. But what I can tell you from this map is that it is pretty widespread in Texas. Um, almost all counties are reporting some flu activity. Um, here's a Tarrant County view, again, a difference between week one and week three. As you can see, the colors are a little bit lighter. So we've had a little bit of a reduction uh, from week one till now. Uh, but the areas of focus have shifted. The zip codes that are uh, heavily impacted have shifted a little bit. That's just but there routine. is a one week lag, is there not? Correct. In, in yes, these sir. statistics? Yes, sir. This data is about a week uh, behind. Uh, so like today, it would actually be about a week and a half old. Because in yes, the sir. last week, I know five people, including one on my staff, who have come down with the flu, and he had a flu shot. Correct. So um, it just feels like it's becoming more intense. Right. And, and again, you know, as you can see, most of the zip codes have color in them. That means activity is still there. Uh, it's just that the deeper colors, if you go in those particular zip codes and talk to the residents or go visit medical facilities, you'll find that a lot more people are you know, going sick to the ER because this data is based on ER visits. Um, so you'll find that in those particular areas, there's just a higher concentration. So if you're feeling the effects in your office, you can imagine in uh, 76011, that's you know, or, you know, to the right of the county, um, th that one really probably is heavily impacted. In week one, it was very concentrated in Fort Worth primarily, uh, but it's kind of moved out to Arlington area, uh, and then Crowley, I think, is impacted a little bit. But the other parts of the community still have flu, um, and again, these particular maps show influenza-like illness, so it captures everything other than the flu as well, all the respiratory stuff. Again, the definition for influenza-like illness, we talked about it last time, but it's any fever and uh, with a cough or a sore throat, a fever with more than or equal to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's very broad. Uh, it doesn't indicate exactly flu, but captures most influenza-like illness. Can we 
you remind us or remind me if there's no coloration, what does or doesn't go? Right. So uh, in the thick of the season, it's just a reporting gap from a data standpoint. It doesn't mean that there's no activity of flu. Uh, I would find it very odd that there's no activity of flu. It's just that the reporting of data did not happen in those zip codes. Uh, and that happens for a variety of reasons uh, that either the participating hospital or ER just didn't present the data to us. Or sometimes we've had issues with staff changes or IT upgrades and the data feeds kind of get out of whack and that does happen from time to time. But And then also, if the activity is low below a particular point, then we tend not to share that data because again, for privacy concerns, if there's only like a one or two, uh, I mean, we try to keep it very general. But um, in, the, in these particular cases, because we're in the thick of the season, I would say it was just a reporting gap that people did not report. And again, these are people who presented to an emergency room. Correct. Someone who went to their private doctor or care now for That does not show up in this data. They're not yes. in this data. Correct. It's mostly ER reporting for this particular map. Interesting. So it doesn't even include the urgent care place? No, sir. We, we are trying to rope some of those in. I think uh, one particular system, I can't remember the name, uh, they were in agreement, but I'm not quite sure that we got to the point of getting the data feed from there. So in effect, this is representative of all those people who we don't want going to the emergency rooms for <laughs> Correct. Um, okay, I just wanted to be sure we clarify that. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, if people are gravely ill, certainly they should visit, you know, the emergency room. But, you know, general rule of thumb is if you're starting to get the symptoms of the flu, you know, try to get to your primary care doctor. If that's not available, go to a minute clinic or an urgent care. Don't try to head to the emergency room, one, because you're probably going to catch a lot more stuff out there than you want, and two, you're really going to get a very expensive bill uh, for something as simple as the flu. If you're gravely ill, that's a whole other story, then you might need admission to the hospital. Does it capture, for example, at JPS, we have an emergency room, and they, they basically screen and then send folks that they don't believe are there for emergency, Correct. they send them over to the urgent care? Yes. Are we capturing their, the folks that yes. they've moved to the urgent care? Yes, sir. That data is logged and reported because their visit is first recorded in the EMR as an emergency room, and then they got screened over, so that data does get reported. Okay. Yeah. So then in the future when I'm reading this, I can expect that some of these numbers essentially, I don't want to use the term over-reported, but I can't think of a better way to say it because like 76006, that's my zip code. But there's not an ER. I think there are a few urgent care clinics. But if I were to go to Texas Health or um, Arlington Memorial, it would be reported from that. Zip right. Code. It's based on your zip code of residence. Of residence so health. it doesn't matter if there's an ER in that particular zip gotcha. code or not. It's wh what you reported as your address, and that's how they would report the information to us. Yes. So for example, mine is 76054. It's no data. <laughs> that just may mean that we went to our primary care, we went to an urgent care clinic, we didn't go to an emergency room. Well, or if the people who went to an emergency room, that hospital system somehow either had a data glitch or did not report. I'm sure we were just good and did what we were told to do in the video. <laughs> we'll we'll settle that down. Sir, how about that? <laughs> People are good. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll carry on with the lab confirmed hospitalization. So there's a little bit of good news hidden in those graphs. As you can see, uh, the graphs are trending down. So this is a weekly view. Um, the green line, that's the very top line, is indicative of senior uh, population, age group 65 or older. Uh, and for the last two or three weeks, we're starting to see a decline in hospitalizations. And that's always good news. That, that shows us that we're making progress here uh, in the flu season. Um, the other lines are trending down as well. As you can see, the little uh, blue line, which is indicative of the very young zero to four uh, year of age group is also trending down. Uh, and those two are usually the ones that you know go up. Uh, the very young and the senior age group uh, get impacted more with the flu. Um, hopefully, neither one of you are there. <laughs> uh, national influenza-like illness picture. Again, back to influenza-like illness. So this is not just the flu. It's all influenza-like illnesses. Um, the red line with the triangle uh, data plots, uh, that's the current season, 2018-19 season. As you can see, we took a dip for the last uh, couple of weeks and then a little resurgence back up again this week. Uh, but, you know, we're still 
okay. Uh, not as bad as 2017-18 season. That was the light blue line that was really heading toward a big peak uh, at this point last year. Um, and again, this is the Tarrant County influenza-like illness picture. Uh, the green line uh, is the current season. Uh, we took a dive for a couple of weeks and we've sort of stabilized and starting to see a little uptick again in, in data. Uh, reminder that we tend to see a um, peak in February, late February. Um, so we still have time um, and this may, the picture may change. But again, uh, signs are good. People need to, again, participate. Uh, cough and sleep, you know, sne uh, sneeze in your sleeve. So that's very good practice. Uh, thank you for demonstrating that this morning. Um, and also staying home when you're sick and taking your flu shot. Uh, if you haven't taken one, certainly take that and get antivirals uh, if you're starting to feel the impact of flu. Uh, they're most effective within the first 48 hours. After that, they still work, but the effectiveness reduces. CDC came out with a first time ever uh, mid-season estimate of what is going on with the flu. And part of the reason was last year was a very, very heavy flu year. Uh, on a typical average season, we see about 36,000 deaths with flu, which is very a very big number for, uh, for any disease. Uh, last year, we had close to uh, 80 to 90,000 reported deaths. Um, so that was a very uh, heavy season for us. So this year, CDC started to put out some early estimates about the burden of disease. Uh, 9.6 million estimated flu illnesses, 4.6 million medical visits, and 114,000 hospitalizations already reported uh, till January 12th of this year. And the flu reporting season starts October 1. So that's still a lot, uh, but it's not as bad as last year that we saw, uh, but it's still fairly heavy. And again, like I was mentioning, you know, what people should do is take the flu shot, stay home when sick, and get antivirals uh, if you have the flu. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. The one question, and I'm going to go back to the previous question with regards to how are we getting this data. I would, as I recall, there seemed to be at some point in time we were getting data from the primary care physicians they were actually calling in that data on a weekly basis. And the reason I say that is because we had major groups, NTSP, uh, Larry Tatum's group. I, they were basically calling in that data on a weekly basis. Did they stop that or why are we no longer getting that? I will look into that and get back with you. Um, ever since I've been here, I think most of my understanding has been is that we switched to that electronic uh, collection of data through ER. But I know what you're talking about. It's the uh, Sentinel Surveillance Network. I believe that data does come in, but I'll have to double check to make sure that that's in included. I would think it is included in the report. Well, let's but the check, Sentinel Surveillance to me, Network, that's much more, it's going to be a much more meaningful report than just who showed up at the emergency room. Correct. Uh, with this data. Right. I will double check on that and then clarify next time uh, on whether we include that Sentinel Surveillance uh, Network data. But you're, you're absolutely right. There was a recruitment effort to get the physician offices involved, and it's not every physician office. It's a particular Sentinel site where we think there's, you know, a lot of uh, client activity that people go there uh, just to get a, you know, gauge the temperature of what's going on. Because flu is not individually reportable. Uh, so it's more like let's dip our toe in the water and see if it's warm and the flu activity is there in the community. And that's what the influenza-like illness surveillance does. It just kind of gives you a gauge of how your community is doing with flu, whether it's trending up or down. Because, again, it's so widespread every year that it doesn't make sense to report every single case. Just to get a gauge of what's going on would be plenty enough to take action. Any other questions? Well, I'd be interested in, I had mentioned my zip code, 76006, but there was also 75054, which that's a very dense area in precinct, too. I'd be curious to see what, if there's I thought you said 76054. 75054. That would be for your prayer. Yeah. Far, far southeast. Yeah. And then also I learned, I guess, last week that uh, pregnant women who take antivirals <coughs> increases their likelihood of preterm labor. Wasn't previously knowledgeable of that, so uh, the risk of uh, having the flu while you're pregnant is higher than worrying about any side effects. Um, flu can be very deadly. Young children, seniors, and pregnant women are the three groups that actually die of the flu a lot. 
Um, so I would say if you have the flu, certainly get the antiviral. Anything you do has side effects. I mean, trust me, the air you breathe has side effects. So uh, I would talk to the physician, unless you're contraindicated for a medication, they'll guide you away from it. Uh, but if somebody's pregnant and has the flu, certainly the recommendation is get treatment early because you don't want to die of it and, you know, and worry of uh, getting side effects. Any other I questions? I think that would be a pretty severe side effect. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Vinny. Yes, sir. Members of court on item B, this is the legislative update. Uh, Mr. Schaffner has provided uh, some material in your, in your packet. Uh, I would like to point out three issues as it relates to his memorandum. First of all, on the assignment or committee assignments in the House especially, uh, Tarrant County did very well in uh, both uh, chairs and vice chairs of, of various committees. So I, I think that's a real positive for our county. Second of all, something that is very dear to uh, the commissioner's court is the unfunded mandate issue. Uh, there are uh, uh, joint resolutions filed both in the Senate and the House which would restrict unfunded mandates uh, to local governments. And then finally, uh, you, there was an article in the paper the other day and it deals with uh, uh, Chairman Guerin's HB 705 which is the sales tax substitution for property tax. I've asked Mr. Schaffner to put together some briefing material for the court, and uh, we should have that uh, within a week or so, and we'll just bring that to court for your discussion. And I would think that at that point in time, he would also, uh, if we were of a mind to pass a resolution, then he would prepare a Yeah. We'll, we'll draft a, a position statement then also to yeah, compliment on it then. So, but um, and hopefully we'll see if we can get Mr. Schaffner here for that for that briefing also because I know that he has been working uh, with uh, with Representative Guerin's office on this so and we can provide more information. I'm curious as to whether when we speak of inter of unfunded mandates whether the legislature's understanding of an unfunded mandate is the same as our understanding of an unfunded mandate. Are we talking about the same things? I think there is a real uh, issue as far as truly defining what an unfunded mandate is. I know, Judge Whitley, you've been working on that for quite a while now. And yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's clarity in definition. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would, and I will tell you that the more I have kind of gotten into it, if, if you look at history and you go back even to the creation of counties and why the state created us, it was to basically, because of the size of the state, it was to uh, fulfill their obligations in certain areas. Right. And in effect, what they said was, is we're going to create, we're going to pass the laws, y'all are going to implement implement them and we're going to allow you to charge a property tax in order to do that so in effect everything under that thought process everything is an unfunded mandate i believe that what has caused us to begin to bring so much attention to it is that within the last decade this is a lot more than you want to hear but you ask and so you gave me that door um, in the last decade, I'm hanging on your every I word. I know you are. Uh, they have decided to blame us for paying for those things they've told us that we have to do. And so I think our pushback has been we're going to call it an unfunded mandate because you've refused to bring us to the table and continue to treat us as a partner in the deal. And in fact, you're blaming us for it. The one thing that I would distinguish is a little bit different in that is that the state's prisoners that we currently have sitting down in our jail they have been convicted the clerks have them paper ready for pickup to the to be transported to the state or the individual has violated parole and we're waiting for um, the state to decide what they're going to do with them and in both of those instances those are prisoners that belong to the state and they don't pay us a dime for those. And last week, at one point in time, or maybe it was the week before last now, 
We had 304 of those prisoners sitting in our jail. And the, the sheriff has estimated that the cost for those prisoners are about $70 a day. So that was $21,000. And last year, the state estimated, not the state state, but the counties estimated that the state had failed to pay us about $100 million for those prisoners. Blue, blue warrant? Yeah. Awesome. All over the state. Um, and so to me, that is not necessarily an unfunded mandate. That's just they're not paying for what they're not paying for their bill. Uh, I think the whole discussion, though, could I mean, what we're saying is an unfunded mandate is now is you pass a law and you don't pay for it. Well, yeah, that's really always been the case. But now they've started blaming us. The left hand passes the law and says we have to pay for it. And then the right hand complains about the fact that we pay for it. My, my concern is that the legislature will pass some little jive, rinky-dink kind of bill that they say addresses unfunded mandates that does nothing to address our problem, yet they claim credit for having passed an unfunded mandate I bill. I thought Jim Allison explained it real well one day in one of our meetings. He said that to the state, the unfunded mandates that they don't want to recognize that we're paying for today, they won't do anything on those. If they do pass that little rinky dink law, it'll only be on something in the future that they pass that they <laughs> want us to pay for. So what we're paying for today isn't going, isn't going to change. And the reason we're claiming that it, that it must be a constitutional amendment is because if it's just, well, by majority vote, they can basically say this isn't an unfunded mandate and you got to pay for it, then that will happen all the time. Um, but again, if you go back on what I had said earlier, under that scenario, you got to remember, many of them have signed those little cards, those little pledge cards that says, I'm not raising your taxes and I'm not going to increase your fees. So it's very difficult for them to pass a law that requires more money to be spent by the state, so they just pass the law and then make us pay them more money. And then they didn't they didn't violate their little signature on that card. Clearly an unfunded mandate. Yes. And so um, it's we're far away from now everybody says, you know, I guess what you know the, they say here that the legislature, you know, has said we're not gonna through those two joint resolutions, the Senate is ten the House is 30 that, you know, we're not going to pass unfunded mandates. The House passed that joint resolution last time. The Senate wouldn't even hear it. Um, so nothing happened. Um, and they say they're going to do it this time, just like they say they're going to put more money in education, but they hadn't explained yet where the money's coming from. And I'm a little nervous when they don't explain where the money's coming from. Because I know in the past when they've not explained that we got to pay it. Well, the well, they're talking about it, but again, they're telling how they're going to pay for it. They don't. They nobody has yet, and we've asked that question several times in groups with the with the governor's staff and with other legislators. You're proposing this raise. Where are or how are you going to pay for it? And nobody's been offered that up. I guess one of the things that I would also say about that is if very much I believe we all believe in local control. And so, that, so instead of the state saying we're going to give every teacher a $5,000 raise regardless of how that teacher may be doing or whatever, I would rather see them decide how much more money they're going to put into education and then let the local school districts decide how they're going to use those additional funds within their particular district. Um, we're still in the first month. A lot yet to come. Yeah. There's and and there's one other aspect of the unfunded mandate, and really it's the underfunded mandate, is whenever and we have situations that exist today where there is a task or responsibility that's assigned to local government, a fee is collected to pay for that for that service. Yet the fee goes to the state, and the state doesn't disseminate all the money they collect for that fee, and we have to make up the gap. 
on that. Well, and then there's also the fees that they collect that they don't spend because they got to balance the budget. And the That's why they do that. LIRAP is one of those. Yeah. And the rainy day funds. The rainy day funds. Mm -hmm. And then also the um, a lot of the fees that they have, penalty fees that they've placed on, you know, driver's license, violation for, you know, DWIs or different things along that line, that was supposed to go into a trauma fund, and it did. And it's still in the trauma fund because they have not appropriated the money and spent it because they needed it to be in there to balance their budget. The same thing with indigent defense from time to time. They collect more money, but instead of letting us or them now distribute that money back out to the counties, they've said, no, you can only distribute so much of it, the rest of it we've got to hold on to so that we can balance our budget. And I think as local elected officials at all levels, we need to be explaining this to our citizens because all they're hearing is that property taxes are out of control and the sky is falling. And the state government's going to fix it. And the state government's going to fix it. Okay, so we will go. Tell Russell we missed him. So, so we're, we'll bring that briefing back on HB 705 in a week or so. Finally, members of the court, we have one final uh, briefing item. This is item number C. This is an update from the criminal district attorney's office. Ms. Wilson is here to address the court at this time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Judging commissioners, thank you very much for the opportunity to do this first ever briefing on the criminal district attorney's office. We're very happy to be able to tell you a little bit about what we're doing um, and to thank you for a lot of the efforts that you've been able to allow us to do over the last four years. I would ask judge and commissioners if you would instruct them to turn on the PowerPoint, please. PowerPoint is not loaded. We do not have a PowerPoint. Okay, I turned it in yesterday, and I've actually brought it on a thumb drive, so if we could load it, I need it to present to you all. There were problems yesterday with when facilities looked at it, there was mm -hmm. some of the stuff that was on there about security issues. Well, actually, those are floor plans, which under open records would likely be available anyway. They don't deal with infrastructure, and they don't deal with security. So from a legal standpoint, I am not concerned about the, well, uh, the security but the floor plans have it. not been approved by us, and they've not been put into public record yet. And so we can argue all day long about whether or not it's subject to public record. Okay, then if you will allow, I'll bring in my equipment and just show it to you behind me, and that way it won't be in the public. No. Okay. I will try to find some other transparent way to brief you all on what's going on with the DA's office oh, sure. and, and uh, do that in the future. I think we can, uh, that would, I, you know, we have procedures that are set up and I'm about that we ask all department heads, that we ask everybody to go through in order to put something on our agenda. Which I abided by because I turned mine in yesterday. Well, so, but yes. we asked most people to turn it in on the Wednesday before. And we and we really, most places, require a much longer period of time in order to get onto an agenda. And we have told our administrator's office that we want to cut that down and that Wednesday is the time frame. Yes. GK gave you until yesterday at 1 to turn it in, and once we turned it in, we actually loaded it, and then Mr. Phillips looked over it and said, wait a minute, we don't ever show security and different things like that. It needs to be pulled down, and so we pulled it down. So that's part of the reason why we asked for that. Now, again, it's I, I want you to come back, and, I, and I, the whole court wants you to come back. But we, you know, we try to say to everybody, including ourselves, and sometimes we're not as critical on ourselves, but we try to be, that says we're going to follow a set of procedures. And that's all we're asking you to do. May I be heard? You sure can be heard. 
Um, if I had been told yesterday that all they wanted were one or two slides removed, we would have agreed to that and I would have spoken to it anyway. We had plenty of time. Let's be honest, these are thumb drive presentations and I understand that GK and David were able to um, object to two or three slides, that's fine, but we weren't given the option to remove those two or three slides. And we would have had plenty of time to do that yesterday, and I would still be able to speak on the issue. So having that happen, I understand that, you know, perhaps I just need to come in public comments. I do think there are some things that you all, as the, as, I, and I realize I don't report to you. I've tried over the last term to be very open and honest with you about what we do in our office. And honestly, most of my presentation is to thank you for things that you've done for our office. There are some challenges, but that's true anywhere. So I will just try to find some other way to be transparent with that information. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to appear here today. Um, you know, I apologize that I can't tell you about my office today. Your Honor, I'm not comfortable with this. Um, so, an elected official should not be precluded from speaking because a department head has some unreadiness about the presentation. So, let me let me address that. We received normally whenever we have any information that goes into the. Uh, electronic court book which becomes the permanent record of the commissioner's court we ask that you first notify us on wednesday so we can get it on the agenda by thursday noon you're supposed to have all your material to us we ask the district attorney's office beginning thursday about the powerpoint they said they were still working on it we extended that to friday they were still working on it we extended that to Monday, to Monday, which is yesterday, which is against any other type of uh, leeway we give to any department. They presented the PowerPoint to us, and we loaded it into our system. And it was on the electronic book, and it was on the web. <clears throat> yesterday afternoon, and after looking at the PowerPoint, I called facilities and said, there's a facility component on this PowerPoint. And I said, I asked David to be able to discuss it if the court actually had any questions about facilities. And so he did. He looked at it. They contacted my office at uh, almost five o'clock yesterday afternoon. And uh, David had had a discussion with the district attorney's office. And at that time, there was a decision to pull, not by us, not by facilities, but by the district attorney's office, a request to pull it down off the web, off of our electronic court book. And this was after five o'clock. So we arranged with our staff to, to get back together and we pulled it off. And we said that anything that, that was presented in court would become part of the official record. That's all we did, but we notified them that, that it was off the electronic book. We locked that system down on Mondays. So to infer that it was a department, either the county administrator or facilities, who said pull it down, it was in conjunction with the administrative staff of the district attorney's office. My position was, was that if it's being presented in court, it's a public document, and therefore we should post it on the web like we do everything else. We were requested after five o'clock yesterday by the DA's office to pull it down, and that's what we did. So it was not, it was not my office, and it was not Phillip's office that says we're pulling it down. And I'll have, I've got the emails to show it. Shannon, you want to come forward? I just want to say that I did not infer anything. It was plainly stated that that was what happened. What I just told I merely you, repeated it. What, I didn't infer yeah, anything. I understand, Commissioner, but what I've told you was what happened yesterday afternoon. 
Hi, um, good morning, Court. Um, just for clarification, I was contacted by David Phillips late in the day. It was after 4.30 when I was able to contact him. And um, he mentioned the security um, concerns that he had. And so at that time, um, what my understanding was was that we could uh, request that it would be taken down for the evening so it would not be on the online overnight, but that it was going to be pulled back up in the morning for us to be able to show today in court. So that's where that was not clear to me that it was wasn't going to be able to come up um, to be presented today and so um, there was some confusion in regards to that but um, so that's how that dialogue um, came about our intention was not to block this our intention was to do what the DA's office requested yesterday quite frankly putting it back up today that was I don't know who t who said that if it was facilities mm -hmm. I will tell you through this whole process a process that that is situated in our office so, so, solely. We were never contacted by the district attorney's office. We went, had to go through an intermediary, which was facilities. I didn't get the emails that, that were back and forth, and I wrote an email to both, both Shannon and David that any material that we pulled it down because we were requested to, and that any materials <laughs> that would be presented today in court because I was under the understanding there may be a handout. And I said those materials had to be entered into the system because our records, our official records for the court is an electronic record. It's the video, if you will. And so we enter those documents. So it's, it's into the court's register. And um, in fact, we talked this morning I said, when I said, you know, we don't have the video, we didn't, and it was a surprise. And we said, if you'd like to show the video, let's bring it back next week. That way you can delete whatever slides you want to and we'll put it up. There was not any attempt at all to block anything from the district attorney's office coming to this court. Our office was never contacted and we're the ones responsible for what goes to the court. Thank you for the clarification, Mr. Peters. I believe that we've got a system in place that allows our department heads and our elected officials to be able to bring things to court on a relatively short notice basis, less than a week, because they put it in on Wednesday and we show it on Tuesday. And I think we also have been very amenable to, if there is an emergency situation, that we will allow certain corners maybe to be cut in how we present things. This is not an emergency situation. I don't understand why there was the urgency that we couldn't, if, if we didn't have it already by Wednesday, we, it's not like we don't meet pretty regular around here. We meet once a week. And uh, I don't understand why Again, in situations where it is basically a report of what's happened over the last six months, why that can't be postponed a week and we follow the same procedures that we require department heads and elected officials to follow. And um, we charged GK and his office with preparing that and getting it to us. Um, and I think that, uh, again, I am very interested in hearing what's happened. I mean, I think you've done some great programs. And I've said that. But I also believe that, that there's nothing urgent about it being today versus being next week or the week after that. Um, and so certainly, if we can't get it done by Wednesday, we ought to, unless it's an emergency situation, unless Vinny's got some mosquito that's flying around doing everything, then, you know, I don't know that we can't wait one additional week to get all the information in, in shop. So I don't want you to go to an alternative method of getting information out. I want you to go through the, the normal chain, and I don't think we're being unreasonable and saying, get it to us by Wednesday and we'll have it on court on, you know, six days later. Um, so I hope that we can look at this next week and have the same presentation and
talk about whatever, but not talk about things that concern you from a security standpoint or anything else from that standpoint. With that, do we have anything else? That's all we have at this time, Your Honor. Then we will recess our open meeting and proceed to close to discuss items exempted under Section 5, 571, 072, 074, 076, and 087 of the Texas Government. Having returned from our closed session, there being no business to address at this time, we stand adjourned. <laughs>